The economy is collapsing. We're in a Great Depression 2.0, but there is a way to fix it. I'm going to explain this to you in three simple, fast steps. Step number one, let's go over the Keynesian idea of aggregate demand, also aggregate supply. Before we get there, I want to explain why I said I think we're in a Great Depression. I think you'll agree. First of all, we have to look at the output of the private sector. Let's think about this. We could have GDP remain the same if government spending was 100% of the economy, but none of us would say the economy is healthy or fundamentally sound. The way we increase our living standard is by having the private sector produce more goods and services efficiently. So in a depression, the private sector is responsible for less and less GDP. So the real GDP of the private sector going down. We could have an inflationary depression or a deflationary depression if prices are going up, but GDP isn't going up at the same level that would be a decrease in real GDP when you adjust for inflation. Deflationary depression is what we most often think of, and that is when asset prices and consumer prices are going down. But overall, the standard of living for the average Joe and Jane is going down regardless of what the nominal GDP headline number is reading. So what mainstream economists will do, especially Keynesian economists, is they'll look at a few different metrics and set things up in this cause and effect in a graph or chart. We'll get into that in a moment. And then the solution they always prescribe is a tops down government controlled micromanagement of the economy in order to incentivize the entrepreneurs, the average Joe and Jane to take the action they want. We'll go over that in just a minute. Where the Austrian approach is more to look at psychology and let the economy work itself out through the actions of the individual. One of the main models the Keynesians use and the mainstream economists is a aggregate supply and aggregate demand curve, which is interesting because they're not curves at all, <laughs> they're straight lines. So I have no idea why they call this a curve. The horizontal line on the bottom represents real GDP, adjusted for inflation. So as this line, this dotted line, moves further to my left, your right, real GDP goes up. As it moves this way, GDP goes down. On the left, or the vertical axis, we have price levels. So if this dotted line is going up, so are prices in the real economy. It's going down, prices are going lower. If aggregate supply increases, this line moves down to the right. If it decreases, this line moves up and to the left. We can kind of see how this works just by looking at the example I pointed out before of a decrease in aggregate demand. So this is our equilibrium point. Prices are here. GDP is here. If we go down to the left, then prices are lower, and so is GDP. The opposite would happen if we had an increase in aggregate demand, then economic output would increase because the line would shift to the right and prices would increase because this line would shift up. And believe it or not, most mainstream economists think the entire economy can be managed just by these two lines, <laughs> the aggregate supply and aggregate demand curve. <laughs> Here's what I mean. If the line goes too far to the left, well, all we have to do is increase government spending, lower interest rates, so people take on more and more debt. That always solves the economic problem. <laughs> so then what you have is more spending or more aggregate demand moving this line closer to equilibrium. Problem solved. 
And according to Keynes, and this is very important, government spending would take aggregate demand back to where it needs to be, but then the animal spirits of the entrepreneur would kick in and they would start to create more goods and services than the government spending could go down. To understand this better, let's go to a real economist <laughs> from the internet editor. Let's cut to the clip. If there's a decrease in aggregate demand, that would mean we're now in a recessionary gap. That means our output, where we currently are, our actual GDP, is less than our potential GDP, or our full employment GDP. That amount is called a recessionary gap. Now, this is going to happen in the short run, but what's going to happen in the long run? Well, we could do some sort of government policy to try to close the gap, or we can let the economy fix itself. The economy is self-correcting over time. So eventually, if we had a recession, wages will fall and the prices of resources would fall, and that means aggregate supply would shift to the right, putting us back at full employment. In the textbook, this totally makes sense, but when it comes to the real economy, we usually use some sort of government intervention to close a recession because this might take decades. And I want to point out in that last clip, he says that mainstream economists understand that if you leave the economy alone, sooner or later, it will come to that equilibrium point that the Keynesians desire, that perfect spot right in the middle. But in their minds, they think that that could last decades. So why not just take a shortcut with government spending and creating artificially low interest rates, incentivizing the average Joe to take on more debt and spend it into the economy. But here's some of the problems. First and foremost, this is dependent upon animal spirits coming back. What if they don't? And it doesn't address any underlying issues. Why did aggregate demand go down in the first place? Why are we looking at the symptom? Shouldn't we focus on the initial problem? Also, the more the government spends, the more they distort the economy, create malinvestment, and misallocate scarce resources with alternative uses. I think the easiest way to picture this, this is how I see it, is this graph chart, supply, demand curve, whatever you want to call it, it looks neat and tidy. And in a way, it tries to make economics a science. And it works in a textbook. But in reality, this isn't how a complex system with billions of transactions a day, like our economy, actually works in real life. We are flawed, emotional human beings <laughs> that are conducting those transactions. And you can't just simplify it into a chart. You have to look at the emotional components of it. You definitely have to look at the Austrian business cycle and credit expansion. More on that in a moment. And the best example I can give you is this demand supply chart of my own. <laughs> but this is a demand and supply graph or curve or whatever for everybody's favorite heroin guy. And he is passed out on the streets of San Francisco with his needle and whatever coming out of the needle. And on the left, we have that same horizontal line. Instead of GDP though, on the left, he is completely dead. <laughs> on the right, this guy is high as a kite. So we want him somewhere right in the middle where he's functional. We'll call it an equilibrium point, <laughs> just like you had right here. If heroin guy doesn't get enough heroin, this line goes down into the left. He gets closer and closer to being dead. But if this line goes up into the right, he gets way too high to function in public. So if we want him functional, he needs to be right in the middle. So if he gets closer to being dead, well, the solution, of course, is just give him more heroin. And that takes this line back up to where it used to be. Now, I'd ask you, have we solved any of heroin guy's problems or have we just made it worse? Most of you watching right now would say, of course, we haven't solved any problems. That's obvious, George. Okay, 
Why haven't we solved any problems? Because we haven't addressed the underlying issues. So if it's this way with heroin guy, why isn't it the exact same thing with our economy when instead of using a liquid form of heroin, we are using a monetary heroin? At the end of the day, it's the exact same problem. We're not addressing the underlying issues and the solution is actually making the problem worse. Step number two. Now let's go over the non-mainstream view as to what creates an economic downturn or depression. And remember, the way I see an economic downturn or depression, the way I define it, I think you should maybe think about it this way as well, is it's really a downturn in the economic output of the private sector. Well, let's start by going over this chart or diagram of the business cycle. And this is the mainstream view of the business cycle. And the Austrians and the Keynesians have a different take on it. But let's just go over this to give you an idea so we have a starting point. At the bottom, this horizontal line represents the recession and the recovery, so the full business cycle. This red line is what's most important. The mainstream economists would see this as if the economy is running at full employment. I don't see it that way. I think this red line should represent if the private sector is running at 100% capacity as far as producing goods and services efficiently. Because we could be at full employment in communist Russia, but it doesn't necessarily mean that our standard of living is improving. <laughs> our standard of living would be decreasing. So who cares about full employment? It's all about the output of the private sector. But this red line also indicates real GDP, the trend line. And we see this blue line going up, down, and then up again. So it's peaking out here, bottoming out. And the mainstream economists would see this as a result of inflation. So if full employment was right here, and if demand went up, as an example, more than the economic output, then you would see price inflation. We have the boom phase, which turns into the bust part of the cycle, bottoming out. This increases the unemployment rate, which would indicate the economy isn't running at full capacity. I want to point out one thing that's interesting. Mainstream economists and Keynesians seem to think that inflation in and of itself, so consumer price inflation, means that there's more economic output or greater demand. They completely ignore that we can have consumer price inflation as a result of more and more currency units being produced as the supply of goods and services remains the same or actually goes down. I think it's very interesting that they almost always associate inflation with positive economic growth. This is one of the main reasons you always hear the people at the Fed or the talking heads on CNBC or Bloomberg say we've got to get inflation, we've got to get inflation, because in their minds, prices going up means that the economy is somehow doing better. But we'll come back from that tangent and focus on the topic at hand. So the real question is, does this aggregate demand just completely collapse on its own? Or does it collapse because of investment, which some mainstream economists would lead you to believe? Or is there something else that we're just not seeing that produces this boom bust cycle? To find out more, let's go right back to the internet. This is an article from Mises.org. I think most of you probably saw that one coming a mile away. <laughs> I tried to disguise it over on the whiteboard video, but I think you knew where I was going with this the whole time. So. This is a group of essays from Ludwig von Mises about the Great Depression. 
After the Depression hit, he wrote in 1931, his essay was called The Cause of the Economic Crisis. And the essays kept coming in 1933 and 1946, each explaining that the business cycle results from central bank generated loose money and cheap credit, and that the cycle can only be made worse by intervention. Credit expansion cannot increase the supply of real goods. It merely brings about a rearrangement. I was talking about in step number one with the distortions in the economy. It diverts capital investment away from the course prescribed by the state of economic wealth and market conditions. It causes production to pursue paths which it would not follow unless the economy were to acquire an increase in material goods. As a result, the upswing lacks a solid base. It is not real prosperity. It is an illusion of prosperity. It did not develop from an increase in economic wealth. Rather, it arose because the credit expansion created the illusion of such an increase. Sooner or later, it must become apparent that this economic situation is built on sand. So the collapse of the aggregate demand curve or straight line, whatever you want to call it, doesn't happen just out of magic. It doesn't just fall out of the sky. It's a result of excessive credit expansion by something outside of the free market itself, outside of the private sector, i.e. government or central banks, the central planners themselves. So when the economy gets distorted, when those resources are misallocated and when there's malinvestment, at some point in time, it tips over and comes crashing down. Of course, you're not going to have any aggregate demand, nor are you going to see the animal spirits. So when the government comes in and starts to spend money, QE, drop interest rates, increase the amount of debt in the system, this doesn't fix it, it only makes matters worse. We're going to get to that in just a moment. But another thing that the mainstream economists completely ignore is the psychological component as to what is going on in the real economy. I think this is crucial. And my good buddies Emil Kalinowski and Jeff Snyder discuss this extensively in their most recent episode of Making Sense. They talk about uncertainty in the real economy. And they point out a story going all the way back to 1873 with a gentleman named Carol D. Wright. He was one of the first people, if not the first person in the United States to actually come up with unemployment data. This was in response to the crisis 1873 and what some call the Long Depression. Now, I don't know if it was really a depression. Don't want to get into it now. That's for a completely separate video. But the point was the economy wasn't running at full capacity or that's how they perceived it to be. So they hired Carol Wright to come in and figure out what was going on with the people who were unemployed in the state of Massachusetts. Then in 1885, he was hired by the U.S. government as the first commissioner of labor. And his job was really to find out, okay, why was there an economic slowdown? And the conclusion he came to is it has really nothing to do with graphs or charts or aggregate demand or supply curves <laughs> or straight lines. It has to do with what's in here. All psychological. To explain this further, let's go right to a clip from Emil and Jeff's last episode of Making Sense. And it's not only an economic one, according to Wright's report. He said that an industrial depression is a mental and moral malady, which sounds absolutely correct. And uh, 
It reminds me of what we heard in Japan about trying to break the depressionary mindset. And as you make the point, it sounds like something straight out of Jay Powell and the, the modern day economic thinking. Yeah, which is that we need, to, we need to focus on emotion and sentiment. We need to break people of their negative thoughts in order to them get them thinking, you know, what John Maynard Keynes called you know, animal spirits, right? It's all about risk-taking, and that's true. It's absolutely true. They, they observed it right up close in the, during the Long Depression that there was, there was an emotional component to all these things. But why do people develop these negative emotions? Where do they come from? Where are these restraining feelings and sentiments where do they derive from? And what uh, Carol Wright said and what most people realize today is that, look, when you have uncertainty and instability, those combined are the ingredients for this, you know, as they said in Japan, this deflationary mindset to take hold and can continue. It really goes back to uncertainty and instability. And so the answer that, you know, some of the answers that put forward in the first annual report by the Bureau of Labor, as well as what we hear about today are, somewhat wrong it's like you know quantitative easing money printing getting moral suasion about inflation these are not answers for instability they don't create stability they create what they think is the opposite force of instability that seems to be more helpful and so you know even from the most basic level even if you give the federal reserve and, and, and governments credit for what they're doing it may not be the right thing just from the fact that they're not they're not trying to foster an environment of stability they're trying to fight one form of instability with another. And I, you know, I think the results speak for themselves because they don't even pass the smell test. And what Jeff is saying there is spot on. The central planners only see a problem in the economy as aggregate demand, just a line on a curve that just goes down into the left. So their solution is just to make that line go back to where it was by using any means necessary. But Jeff points out beautifully that, listen, if you do that through government spending, quantitative easing, bailing out the banking system and Wall Street, artificially low interest rates, incentivizing the private sector to take on more and more debt by just printing money, making the money printer go burr. Editor, throw up the gift that everyone loves really quick. And I would add to what Jeff is saying, when you increase regulations, taxes, when the price of consumer goods go up, especially food prices, when we see asset bubbles and we see social unrest, is this increasing certainty or is it increasing uncertainty? Obviously, most of us would argue that it's creating more uncertainty. Therefore, it goes back to what I was saying originally. The more the government tries to fix the problem, the bigger problem they create. The firefighter is also the arsonist. So how do we fix the problem? Well, first, we've got to figure out a way to reduce or eliminate this business cycle so aggregate demand doesn't go down. And then we have to figure out a way to create certainty. Like Carol D. Wright said back in the late 1880s, it starts with what's in the mind of the general public, the psychology. And from that standpoint, I definitely agree with Keynes. We've got to get the animal spirits back. But how do we do that? Step number three, some common sense solutions. Finally, <laughs> it's been a while and you definitely won't see these if you turn on the TV to CNBC, Bloomberg, CNN, or Fox. That's for sure. But the key I want to focus on is we want to make sure the private sector output is increasing. We're producing more goods and services efficiently. Like I said in step number one, currently this is going down. Editor, let's throw up the chart. Prior to the Cervasa sickness, government spending was about 40% of GDP. According to my calculations now, government spending is up to 57% of GDP. In other words, the private sector output has gone down to 43%. Currently, government spending makes up the majority of 
of GDP. So how do we do this? Well, the first thing we can do is we can decrease the size of government and hashtag end the Fed. But I'm not just talking about end the Fed. I know a lot of you say, George, that's totally unrealistic. Okay, fine. Well, at least reduce the role of the Fed to a minimum, what it was supposed to be when it was set up, or according to what they tell us, <laughs> it was supposed to be. Just backstop the banks, for heaven's sakes. Be the lender of last resort and fight inflation. Make sure that we have a strong, stable, sound currency, for heaven's sakes. We don't want this inflation. All these other mandates, such as unemployment. Now, of course, they're talking about the Fed needs to combat climate change, inequality, or maybe produce some more rainbows and unicorns. <laughs> All those need to go. We reduce the size of the government and the Fed. And to illustrate how commonsensical this is, let's go right back to the internet. I wanted to go back to the business cycle really quick to illustrate my point. So these are the contrasting business cycle theories. So the shape, according to the Austrians and the Keynesians, is boom bust or bust and boom. Okay. <laughs> the cause, artificial credit expansion. Now, listen to what the Keynesians say the cause of the boom bust cycle is. Instability of investment spending. Hmm. Okay. So right away here, just common sense, it seems like is telling me I, I'm, it's easier for me to buy artificial credit expansion. I don't know. Maybe you have a different opinion. Let me know in the comments below. The diagnosis, malinvestment and overconsumption makes a lot of sense. Or the Keynesians believe it's a fall in aggregate demand. Okay. Cure. Let the bust run its course with zero government intervention. For the Keynesians, expansionary monetary policy and fiscal policy. In other words, take on more debt. The cure restated. For the Austrians, let the consumer, the individual, demand dictate prices and resource allocation. The Keynesians, let the government dictate prices and resource allocation. Because we know in the past that's worked incredibly well in places like Russia oh, and communist China. Jeez. Prevention. Don't give money production authority to non-market institutions. In other words, let's trust the free market. But the Keynesians give the government control of money production and a blank check for spending. So just going over this simple one, two, three, four, five, six different contrasting views. I mean, should we call it Austrian economics or should we just simply call it common sense? And those are the no brainer solutions. I think if I would have asked any of you how to improve the economy, you would have said to reduce the size of government and the role of the Federal Reserve. But some things that most people really haven't thought of and which I think would really move the needle. Number one, free banking. And this doesn't mean that you get a free checking account with all those fees and that the bank isn't nickel and diming you to death. This is actually a concept in the way the banking system worked prior to the Civil War in the United States. The Fed and the government wasn't involved with the banks at all. The individuals in the real economy would deposit their gold with the banking system. Maybe in the future it could be Bitcoin. Who knows? Gold, silver, Bitcoin. And then the bank would issue IOUs. They would issue loans to those individuals in the real economy they actually knew on a first name basis. Imagine that. Kind of the community banking that Richard Werner always talks about. There would be no bailouts. Therefore, no moral hazard is created. Like I said, the banks would know the individuals in the community. They would understand which loans were productive, which would go to create more goods and services, like the cattle, the wheat, and the cotton in our simple economy. They would also know which loans were 
are in the no bueno zone. <laughs> so if the heroin guy asked for a loan to buy a McMansion, they would say, hell no, we're definitely not giving that guy a loan because we need to keep all of the loans on our balance sheet. We're not selling them to the government or some sponsored entity like Fannie and Freddie. So my whole point here is the owners of the bank would actually own the balance sheet. It's a novel concept. And if they own the balance sheet, they're going to want to create loans where they'll actually be paid back. And those types of loans are loans that create more goods and services, more economic activity by the private sector. Everyone's interests are aligned. This would not only increase productivity, but it would dramatically reduce the boom and bust cycle we talked about in step number two. Now, I think Mises would argue that we should go to full reserve banking. I don't know. I'm on the fence. I think there's a great Austrian argument for free banking as well as full reserve banking, but that's a topic for a separate video. But let's not forget taking away the uncertainty and replacing it with certainty. So those animal spirits of the entrepreneurs are live and well. They're taking on risk, they're taking on loans, they're putting out their life savings to create more goods and services in the real economy, making society at large richer. How do we do this? Well, the first step is don't change anything. As a longtime entrepreneur myself, I can tell you that I'm not going to put my life savings at risk if I don't know what the laws are going to be tomorrow or the next day. A great example of this is when I tried to do business in Ecuador, and I've used this kind of timeline that I made up, and it sounds comical, but this is actually the way it was. And if you've been to Ecuador, you know exactly what I'm talking about. So let's say this is a year. There, whomever the president is, they just change the laws willy-nilly just based on how they feel that morning when they wake up. So after the first three months, maybe they're going to try out some capitalism. But, oh, no, no, that doesn't work out. That's not going to get me my voters. So let's go back to socialism after six months. And, oh, well, that kind of fails, crashes down. Well, let's give communism a try. And oh, that doesn't work out. Maybe we'll go back to capitalism. It's just all over the place. You never know what the laws are going to be, what you're going to get, the tax rate, capital controls. Who knows? That's why they don't have much foreign direct investment. What entrepreneur would put their money at risk in some sort of society that was willy-nilly? You never knew what you're going to get. Entrepreneurs and investors like certainty. They like the laws to be written in stone. They don't like change. Here in the United States, we could achieve that by going back to something that worked for a long, long time. A novel idea. Why don't we just go back to using the Constitution and not having all of these laws? That's the politicians that get into office and they have to create law after law after law. I always say we'd be better served if they just went to the golf course. They did nothing. And after four years, they just quit. There's a reason the Constitution was set up in a way that made it very difficult to change. The founding fathers knew how important this was to the economy and society at large. We need to go back to being a country of law and not men. We need to remember the importance of rule of law. And I would add consistent rule of law. Let me give you an example. If you were investing your hard-earned money into a stock, a bond, a currency, or maybe into a new business venture, would you rather do that in a place like Singapore or Argentina? A place like Switzerland? or Venezuela, a place like the United States, maybe back when you were born <laughs> in the 1970s, the 1950s, 60s, maybe the 80s, or would you rather do it now? 
You see what I'm saying? You always select the place that's stable, where there's certainty. So to recap, in order to get the private sector running at full capacity, we reduce the size of government, reduce the size of the Fed involvement. We go back to being a bottoms up type of economy instead of this central planning. We try something called free banking. We go back to the 1800s. It worked extremely well then. We get the government and the Fed out of the banking system, the community banks that Richard Werner discusses, and then we increase the amount of certainty by just focusing on the darn Constitution. It worked very, very well for a long period of time. The fact that we are now ignoring it, thinking that we know better and it's a breathing, living document that we should be changing constantly, just like they do in Ecuador, is complete insanity. If we continue to believe that central planning is the answer and the solution, we're going to make the problems even more severe. So the solution to get us out of this economic depression is to just use some good old-fashioned common sense and to go back what has worked so well in the past. For more content that'll help you build wealth and thrive in a world of out of control central banks and big governments, check out this playlist right here and I will see you on the next video.